When Alienware reached out and asked if I wanted to review a few of their monitors, immediately I said yes. I had three monitors to choose from. The AW2721D, which is their 1440p 240Hz model, which you can watch over here. The AW2521H, which is their 360Hz model, which again, you can watch over here. And then there's this, the AW3821DW, which is their 1600p 144Hz 38-inch ultrawide, which you can watch here right now. Now, even though I reviewed the other Alienware monitors already, because I felt like that was just better for my channel's growth short term, this was probably the one I was most excited about because I've never actually experienced an ultrawide before. Sure, I've played with them at Micro Center and Best Buy, but that's not the same as having it right in front of you, on your own desk, with your own PC, using it day to day. And let me tell you, after using an ultrawide, I don't want to go back. You know what else I don't want to go back on? This segue to today's sponsor, me. Two things, actually. Number one is free and helps you. And no, I'm not talking about the like or subscribe button. If you're one of the many people who have been struggling to get any of the newest gaming CPUs and GPUs, visit the Discord link in the video description. You can tell the server what specific part you're looking for, and as soon as that item is in stock, you'll receive a ping with a link to that item. But you'll have to be fast because, as you know, there are a lot of people trying to get this new hardware. We've already had a lot of confirmed orders from people there, so make sure to join to have a dramatically better chance at getting new hardware. Number two, if you want to waste either two or five of your dollars and receive no benefits other than cool RuneScape colored badges next to your name, click the join button under the video. I'm still trying to figure out what to do there to add value, but this is just my way of getting more monthly revenue to become a full-time YouTuber faster. Okay. Let's start with the basics. The AW3821DW has a 38-inch 1600p nano IPS panel and has a 144Hz refresh rate with an 8-bit color depth and 10-bit if you lower it to 120Hz. It also includes VESA's Display HDR600 certification and the Mac Daddy of G-Sync, G-Sync Ultimate. The design is very much the same as any recent Alienware monitor, except for being extremely wide. It's got Alienware's signature design with the gigantic legs that take up so much desk space, you're going to need an airfield to have room for your peripherals. The legs have a wingspan of 24 inches, which is as wide as some monitors, and have a depth of about 12 inches. So basically, if you have this monitor and a large mouse pad, you're going to need a desk that's at least 26 inches long, or you're going to have a bad time like I did when I had to use my girlfriend's 23 inch long IKEA desk before my new desk arrived to my apartment. The legs and stand are metal, but covered in this beautifully sculpted plastic design with RGB and Alienware branding on the side of the stand. The stand includes a wire routing hole and flows into the center rear of the monitor. The monitor itself is pretty bland. There's nothing special about it, but there is one of Alienware's logos and the size of the monitor printed on it in case you forgot how big it was. It has 100 by 100 VESA mounting support in case you want to mount this to a monitor arm or stand. And for I.O., it includes two HDMI 2.0 ports, one DisplayPort 1.4 port, an audio line out, a headphone jack, and a 5 gigabit per second USB Type-B port to power the four 5 gigabit USB Type-A ports on the rear and bottom of the monitor. If you don't want to see the ports or the wiring, the I.O. cover does a good job of cleaning things up. Moving to the front of the monitor, it has a 2300R curve, so it's a bendy boy, but it's not super bendy. You have your standard thin top and side bezels at 105 millimeters thin, this is including the plastic, not just the panel bezel, and a slightly thicker but still slim chin at 165 millimeters, including the thin panel bezel. You have Alienware branding on the center of the chin, with the chin itself being made of metal, as well as more RGB ambient lighting under the monitor, which you can tap to turn it on and off. It also includes tilt, height, swivel, and very small amounts of pivot. Overall, it looks just like any other recent Alienware. The design is one of the coolest looking ones, at least I think, and it's made of nice quality materials. As always though, even though the legs look cool on Alienware's monitors, unlike most other monitors that have legs, I don't think this would look as cool if it didn't have legs. So despite them being the size of an entire continent, I'll give them a pass. Now let's talk about the color performance. Starting with the gamut coverage, it covers 100% of the sRGB color space, 86% of Adobe RGB, and 93% of the DCI-P3 color space. So if you're a professional video editor, this will be mostly fine. I say mostly because there's no color space modes, just profiles to save specific settings you've changed. 
But even without a dedicated profile, gamut volume was pretty good, not going past the boxes they're supposed to be in, acting as if the gamut was clamped, which I can't say the same for when it comes to sRGB or Adobe RGB. To be clear, if you're an intermediate or a professional video or photo editor, you probably have some calibration tool anyway, and if you don't, then you should, so I don't consider this to be too much of an issue. What I do think an issue, for professionals at least, is the less than average grayscale performance and color accuracy. Grayscale performance was pretty poor, hitting an average white point of 7900 Kelvin, or 7900K, which is much cooler than the target 6500K. It's not like this is a bad thing, and honestly, some people, including my girlfriend, prefer a cooler color temperature, but it's nowhere near accurate for professional work, as you can see in the chart below. Delta E's are below average, but again, that's due to how cool the monitor was set up out of the box, with blues being in the 20s, which is super high, overpowering the reds, which are lower than zero, almost hitting a low of negative 10. By the way, if you're curious to know what I changed my RGB values to before starting the calibration process, I set it to 100 red, 91 green, and 75 blue, and that basically fixed grayscale performance, giving an average color temperature of about 6300 Kelvin, which is not far off from the 6500 target, and giving an average delta E of 1.7 instead of 6, which is a drastic improvement. For reference, generally you want delta E's to be below 2, for professional work, or ideally one or lower, which is basically perfect. This applies to all Delta E's. Just be aware that even if you use the same RGB settings as me, your monitor may perform differently and may not look exactly like mine because of manufacturing tolerances. Moving on to the pre-calibrated color saturation sweep, colors are both not displaying the proper color most of the time and are almost always oversaturated. To understand how to read this chart, this is how it works. The white box are the target boxes that the colors are supposed to be in, and the colored circles are the actual result. If it passes the box, that means it's oversaturated. If it's not following the line of boxes, that means that it's not displaying the proper color and is instead displaying the color that it's landing on. So for example, take any of the colors in this chart that isn't blue. The greens, yellows, reds, magentas, and cyans are all oversaturating and displaying the wrong color, while the blues follows the line of boxes, meaning they're only oversaturating. At least mostly. It doesn't follow the boxes towards the ends, but it does the best here. Anyway, what this all means is that the monitor isn't displaying proper colors and is oversaturating. This is more evident when looking at the color checker, giving an average delta E of 4.23 with a messy looking chart. Now all this isn't to say that this monitor is bad, because the fact is, this is about as average as it gets and is in line with any monitor you see on display at your local Best Buy, Micro Center, or whatever your go-to tech retailer is. I'm not here to scare you, I'm just here to let you know what to expect when you buy this beast. Anyway, as always, calibrating the display yields much better results, as it should. Grayscale performance is perfect, giving an average delta E of 0.8, which is less than that perfect 1% I mentioned earlier, and an average color temperature of 6600K, which is very close to that 6500K target. Gamma was almost perfect, but off at 90% for whatever reason. Not sure what that was all about, but I did test it multiple times to make sure that it wasn't a fluke, and it wasn't. Saturation was perfected, giving an average delta E of only 0.46 and a max of 0.96, which is fantastic. And if we move on to the color checker, we can see that the chart looks much cleaner with the colors being where they're supposed to be, giving an average delta E of only 0.57 and a max of 2.15, which was the 35% grays. Still acceptable though. Uniformity is also acceptable. Honestly, it's better than I thought an ultra-wide would be. I figured that since the panel is so wide and curved, that it would suffer from uniformity issues, but that wasn't the case here. Though, the left side of the monitor does perform considerably worse than the right for whatever reason. Dropping from 100% white to 30% grays, and it performs much better. Though, that's inherent with lower brightness, since there isn't much light to show off the imperfections. IPS Glow was about average with this monitor, but one issue I did have was pretty bad backlight bleed on the lower left corner of the monitor. I didn't notice this issue until I had my screen displaying a black image for this particular test, and that's probably because it's on the far left from where I'm normally looking, so I don't consider this to be too terrible. I mean, it is bad looking, but it didn't really hinder my experience. Viewing angles are also great. It's no LG 27GN850 or Dell S2721DGF, but there's almost no angle discoloration, tinting effect, or high contrast effect when looking from any angle. Now let's talk about the experience when using this monitor. As I mentioned in the beginning of the video, I've never experienced an ultra-wide in day-to-day -day use, and after using this, 
I've been constantly thinking to myself, why? Why haven't I used one before? Because honestly, the experience is fantastic. It doesn't matter if you're gaming, consuming media, or doing work. Everything about ultra wides is just great, except competitive gaming, but we'll get to that. Let's start off with productivity. I always knew that you'd be more productive because I mean, come on, you have so much more screen real estate. But oh man, there is a convenience factor that I did not account for. Think of a 27 inch 1080p monitor versus a 27 inch 1440p or 4K monitor. Sure, you can fit more stuff on the higher resolution monitor compared to a 1080p display, but you're still going to have to deal with a small 27 inch 16 by nine aspect ratio. When it comes to an ultra wide, whether it's 1080p, 1440p or 1600p in the case of the Alienware, not only can you fit more stuff on screen, but you'll be able to do so without shuffling things around because you'll be able to keep all your windows at its normal size. This is not something that even a 4K display can do since all the windows will be smaller if you're trying to fit like three or four Chrome tabs or something. When it comes to the whole media consumption experience, one thing I liked was that the black bars I normally see on top of a movie are gone and instead are now sidebars. This basically enlarges whatever I'm watching, making a video bigger than it otherwise would be. I can't show you an example because I don't want to get a copyright claim, but hopefully you get the idea. It's not all perfect though. As I mentioned earlier, it includes Vase's HDR600 certification and it's just not good. Its HDR peak brightness is all right, hitting 673 nits, but combine that with the poor amount of local dimming zones, which shows obvious vertical white lines, and it doesn't matter how many HDR checkboxes this monitor ticks, the experience is just not great, at least personally speaking. I found myself preferring SDR since that didn't include any vertical dimming zones and the viewing experience wasn't far off compared to HDR. Then there's the gaming experience. You ever hear manufacturers say, next level immersion for literally anything new they release? Of course you have. The same thing goes for this monitor. On the reviewer's guide, it has the word immersive a lot, which was a red flag to me. And when going into this monitor, I thought that it was just gonna feel like any other monitor, but wider. Man, was I wrong. Playing games casually on an ultra wide monitor is on a different level compared to your standard 16 by nine monitor. Everything just felt more full. Now, it didn't feel like I was actually in the game. It's not virtual reality, but when I wasn't playing super competitive titles like Valorant or Siege, it really takes up more of your periphery and does make the gaming experience much more enjoyable. It's gotten to the point now where I don't even want to play on a 16 by nine monitor anymore. Combine that with G-Sync Ultimate and you have a tear-free experience no matter how low your frames get since it supports the entire refresh rate range. Though personally, I would prefer G-Sync compatibility to get the price of this monitor lower. Now, remember when I said everything except competitive gaming is better? Well, that's where this falls short in a couple of ways. Number one is that the max refresh rate is 144 Hertz. That's just not high enough to be able to compete in the highest level of competitive gaming. You're going to be at a major disadvantage compared to someone with a 240 Hertz or 360 Hertz display. So if you're looking for a competitive monitor, this ain't it chief. Though that should have been obvious from the beginning. Number two is the input lag. As always, I don't have an input lag tester to test for high refresh rates to tell you what the actual input lag is for the monitor. But when it comes to high refresh rate, fast movement games like Siege or Valorant, it didn't feel as fast as my Zowie, other 240 Hertz monitors or Alienware's 360 Hertz model. It could be my imagination, but I highly doubt it. That doesn't mean it's bad though, because it still has very low input lag. And if you're not at the highest skill level with extremely fast reflexes and fast eyes, then this is something you absolutely will not notice. For the new viewers who aren't familiar with my background, basically I'm really good. So I feel confident in what I'm saying here. Moving on to the pixel response times, since this is my first ultra wide review, I don't have any other direct response time competitors. So I'm going to compare it to the LG 27 GN 850, as well as the MSI PS321 QR creator monitor. By the way, I'm going to review two other ultra wide competitors after this. So give subscribe so you don't miss that. The AW3821DW has three levels of overdrive, fast, which is the lowest and the default, super fast and extreme. At 144 Hertz and 165 Hertz for the MSI, this is how the Alienware stacks up. It holds up pretty well. However, both the super fast and extreme overdrive settings are useless since it introduces a butt ton of overshoot. As for how the fast mode compares to the LG and the MSI, it's kind of hard to pick a winner. They all perform similarly, though the MSI does seem to do the worst of them all, but only marginally. 
Dropping down to 60 Hz also shows similar results between the Alienware, MSI, and LG. It's hard to pick a winner when on their best overdrive setting, but one thing's for sure, the Alienware does bad on super fast and extreme no matter what refresh rate you're looking at. So the best overdrive setting on the Alienware is the fast setting. I see no reason why you would ever go any higher. Again, I will be reviewing more ultra wides right after this, so if you guys want to see more comparisons between this and the upcoming ultra wide monitors, click the subscribe button below. Next is the black equalizer. It has four settings, off, one, two, and three. Starting with Escape from Tarkov in the garage, which is a pretty extreme example, and with the black equalizer set to off, things are pretty dark. Moving to one, then two, then three shows minor brightness improvements with each increase, but still being darker than I would prefer. I wish Dell would improve on their black equalizer because this is the same black equalizer they've been using on all their monitors, at least every single Dell and Alienware I've used so far. This does include a color vibrance feature as well, but for some weird reason, you can only access them on the game one, game two, and game three color preset modes, not anywhere else. Moving on to Rainbow Six Siege, here's off, then one, then two, then three, then three with color vibrance. Overall, it barely does anything, and I'd be reluctant to even call it a black equalizer. So if you're basing your buying decision based off of a good black equalizer and color vibrance, this ain't it. Lastly is the OSD. You have a navigation nipple as well as four buttons, three of which are remappable shortcut buttons and one being an exit button. Pushing the nipple in accesses the full OSD, which drops you in the game menu. In the game menu, you can adjust your preset color modes, enable game enhance mode, which is the timer, refresh rate, which just display your refresh rate on the corner of the display, and display alignment. Then you have response time, which is your overdrive setting, dark stabilizer or black equalizer, and variable backlight, which tells the monitor how you want the dimming zones to act when they're enabled. As I mentioned already, I don't think the HDR on this monitor is that good, and the variable backlight does nothing to change that. Moving on, you have your brightness and contrast setting, input source, alien effects lighting, which lets you adjust all of your RGB lights on the monitor to whatever color you want, audio for when you plug in your headphones or a speaker to the monitor, menu, which lets you change language from English to a bunch of other languages, you can adjust the transparency of the OSD, as well as how long you want it to stay up. Then you have personalize, which lets you adjust shortcut keys on the rear of the monitor, then other, which doesn't really have much. It's fairly simple and straightforward, but for some reason, Alienware's new lineup of monitors don't work with the Dell Display Manager software OSD, so you can't have things change for you automatically anymore like you could with their older models. It makes no sense to me why, but since it hasn't been fixed for a while, I feel like they're not going to do anything about it, and that kind of makes me sad because that software was really good and made life switching between profiles and settings super easy since you could have a profile automatically activate as soon as a particular software was in the foreground. Dell, fix this. I see no reason why you haven't fixed it yet. Anyway, that's everything, at least I think. If I forgot something, let me know down below. But in conclusion, what do I think of this monitor? Should you get one? And is it worth $1,400 or whatever Alienware decides to price it at since it seems to change daily? Well, let's start with my thoughts. It's an amazing monitor with a lot to offer. It really does make gaming more immersive than your standard 16x9 monitor. It's got a very nice 1600p resolution, which means that it's got a higher pixel density than a 1440p display, so it can fit more on screen. And it's got great gaming and color performance, at least when you calibrate it. But at $1,400, it's dangerously close to the price of the Samsung Odyssey G9, which offers a 240Hz refresh rate, a high resolution, 11 more inches, and amazing pixel response times. Now, I'll be honest, I was hesitant in the beginning to get the G9, but after using this, I really want to try it out now. With that said, even though this is a great monitor, I think it's too expensive, and I feel like it would benefit from getting rid of the physical G-Sync module, so the price could drop anywhere from $150 to $300, whatever the cost for that is. I think that would make this a much more compelling option. But should you get one? Well, that depends on what you want. If you just want an ultra-wide monitor, then yes, you should get one. But if you're looking for the best bang for buck ultra wide, I feel like there's better. But I don't know yet because I haven't tried them yet. To be honest, and I'm sorry Dell for saying this, but I gotta stay honest, if you're going to spend this much on an ultra wide, just spend the extra $100 and get the Samsung Odyssey G9. 
To be clear, I haven't tried the G9, so I have no clue if the experience is as good as this, but I don't see why it wouldn't be. What I can say is that I have at least two more ultra wides I'll be reviewing throughout February, so while I'm reviewing those, I'll find out if there's anything special that this monitor offers that those don't. Thanks for watching. If you guys enjoyed the video, leave a like. If you didn't, leave a dislike. If you want to check out any of the stuff I featured in this video, check out the links in the video description. Don't forget to give me your money, I mean support. Follow me on my socials if you want to see some cool stuff. And as always, have a great day every day. Peace.